Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Chloe Carmichael, clinical psychologist and author of the book, Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety, and of course, also the host of the High Functioning Hotspot podcast right here. So today's guest is Vanessa Smith Bennett, who has a super interesting story. She actually was a creative director for brands like Coca-Cola, and then decided that that life was kind of burning her out. So she went ahead and became a yoga teacher, which I was actually a yoga teacher before I was a clinical psychologist. So I was super excited for the chance to speak with Vanessa and learn her story and learn just from her process. I often find that by just hearing the stories of high functioning people, and their process around the changes that they make in their life can be really illuminating and inspiring to me, even if I'm not thinking of those particular changes, just hearing their process, it can be really exciting. So without further ado, here is Vanessa Smith Bennett. Hello. Hi, Vanessa. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? Hey, I'm great. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, uh, of course. I like your tattoo. Can I see that? Oh yeah, it's um, it's my ode to Bowie. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I, I got it the year that he passed away. It was very, very devastating to me. I've been a pretty big ner Bowie nerd my entire life, so it was very sad when we lost him. Yeah, he's a special, special man. If you don't mind, I'm actually just gonna dive right in into something I think kind of special there, which is actually, you know, with high functioning people, sometimes it can be hard to believe in you know, things that are in the abstract or things that we can't always see or know or prove. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, those can be some of the most powerful things in life. So when you said that, you know, David Bowie, you know, passing off the cuff, do you mind sharing like any beliefs that you have about the afterlife? I know that's a deep place to dive in. But <laughs> since it came up, I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, I, I remember in my early 20s, I kind of fell off the whole, like I was very anti-spiritual anything. And then when I started doing my own therapy and my own work, uh, I feel like through that, I actually found my way back to my own version of a spiritual path. Um, you know, I found yoga. Um, the therapist that I was seeing was a holistic therapist and uh, much more of like a spiritually grounded. She actually is ordained as well. Um, and so it was kind of woven in. It was never a force, but it was very woven in. And my yoga practice uh, brought me there. And so for me personally, um, and my background is actually in depth psychology, which is a psychology of the soul. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Carl Jung, who obviously basically is the founder of depth psychology, he practiced from a very spiritual place um, and was steeped in religion and spirituality. And so for me as an adult now, I just realized that you can't, it, my personal belief is that you can't extract a full life from a life that includes spirit. And I think you can take that to mean anything that you want it to mean or, or what means you know, the most to you or what's fulfilling to you. But um, when we go so left brain, so logical, so two plus two equals four, um, we, we cut out a whole section of our psychology, of our psyche, um, of our unconscious that really is meant to thrive in the realm of spirit and in the realm of soul. I agree. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. To be honest, I don't know a lot about depth psychology, but, you know, I, I do like Jung and, um, you know, one of the things that's always fascinated me about psychology is learning that it comes from the Greek word psyche, which actually means spirit, you know, yeah. um, and I'll just share as well that like you, um, it was more in my, you know, late teens or so that I was almost anti-religion because I mm -hmm. had been raised in like a very almost restrictive religious environment. Um and then I, you know, I just kind of rebelled against yeah. it. And actually, I, I came to yoga, um, you know, as a, you know, angry young woman <laughs> um, and, you know, found my way into a yoga class, thank God, uh, because it was just advertised as free. And I was flexible, like literally physically flexible. And so it was the first sport, so to speak, where I ever felt like a star because I, I did cheerleading, but I wasn't coordinated enough. So I was always like, kind of like, you know, like the, the bottom one on the tri-base or whatever. I remember. <laughs> Um, but yeah, for the first time in yoga, I, I felt, I felt, you know, physically talented, but, but it, it was neat because that early religious experiences that I had taught me prayer, which is quiet contemplation. And so then I was able to just get right into mindfulness, um, you know, that way. And, you know, eventually found my way back to uh, religion, which 
you probably know this too. I know you're a therapist um, in associate therapist. Is that right? Associate? I'm, I'm a licensed therapist now. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So I just saw on um, LinkedIn, I think associate, but congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. What a um, journey. <laughs> so as you know, uh, re religiosity, you know, the degree to which a person is religious, you know, has been shown to actually be a protective factor. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I always tell people like, it almost doesn't matter the religion, um, even if the religion is yoga, like mm -hmm. it's, it's, it gives you something um, that, right. that a better base, you know, so, so that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm just super curious, Vanessa. So this show, The High Functioning Hotspot, it's kind of like two things in one. So I'm interested in talking to you about the way you work with high functioning people and all of that kind of stuff. But I'm also interested just in you as a high functioning person. So it's, it's kind of there on both levels. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind sharing maybe a little bit about yourself or the people you work with, um, I'm, I'm, I'm super interested. Yeah. Um, you know, so for my journey into being a therapist, um, originally I really wanted to focus on adolescence and I had a personal interest in that. My, I have a sister who's 16 years younger than me. So uh, I always felt like I was very connected to kind of that young adult um, landscape. I worked with a bunch of uh, young adults when I was, you know, my internship and, and I really enjoyed it. And then it somehow made its way into, it's funny you say high functioning, it, it did somehow make its way into people who, um, reflected back to me things that I had been through in my personal life as well. Um, and if you want to say overcame, whatever that even means, right? But I, I, there was a saying that we had in school, which was um, the clients that you need will find you. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself actually surrounded by many people who, like myself, were the angry something, 20 something year old, right? Uh, not quite sure why they were angry. Uh, you know, relationships weren't as um, enriching as they wanted them to be. A lot of people who were unhappy in their careers were looking to make career transitions, transitional places in their life, period. Um, those who also, like myself, were very curious about uh, Buddhist psychology and mindfulness and, and really wanted to kind of open up to more spirit in their life, more soul in their life. And so that's kind of what it's blossomed into now as far as my practice. I work with a lot of people. For me, everybody I work with, I come from a mindfulness space and a depth and a yogic psychology space um, and Buddhist psychology as well. And so that is kind of like the foundation of all of the work I work with clients on. And then most of the people who come to me, like I said, transitional places in their lives, high functioning, you know, high powered career people who are like, this is not fulfilling me and I don't know what to do, right? I don't know how to bring that fulfillment into my life. Um, and then recently in the last probably two years or so, I've had an influx of people working through codependency issues. And so that's become a big thing for me. Uh, I myself, I like to say I'm a recovering codependent. Uh, and I've done, yeah, I'm like, well, what I was going to say is like, actually, I'm starting to realize that I swear, I think everybody has codependent tendencies um, to a certain extent, you know, different degrees, and they show up in different ways and different relationships, uh, different people trigger different things in us. Uh, and it's very different than what we used to hear, which is like addict codependent. And that was kind of it. Um, that is obviously still an important component to it. But there's so much more to it than that. And so I've realized that it's parlayed to this whole other subsection of people, which is struggling with codependency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, really interesting. I, I have so many questions for you. I'm just trying to choose which one's <laughs> Um But, you know, I, I know that you had a background as being a creative director, you know, for places like Coca-Cola and, you know, really big places, um, which I admire so much because um, I, I could never be a creative director. <laughs> I'm like a little bit more like probably on the, you know, research linear side. Um, yeah. But I really admire people that are able to have that creative spirit, but actually still also fit in to a corporate environment because we've all known creative people that are just like, la, 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 la. And they can't, they, they just want to go march to their own drum and they, they can't ever figure out how to join a band, so to speak. So it's, it's really awesome that you were able to actually thrive in that field as a high functioning person. But then you made a move and decided you wanted to become, you know, get your yoga certification and become a therapist. And as you probably know, most people that try to go into private practice as a therapist, 
I'm sorry to say, don't do very well. You said earlier that they tell you the clients that you need will find you. Most therapists find that's a myth. I actually mm -hmm. have a wonderful program that I teach therapists how to have their own successful practice. It's almost like a side business of mine because yeah. so many therapists just, they, they just don't know. But, but you, you not only thrived as a creative director, you then did a career switch and still thrived in a totally different career. Both fields are not easy for a person to do well in. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious for you, and don't be afraid to toot your own horn a little bit, because <laughs> I'm, I'm asking you to do that here to share with other people so that they sure. can learn from you. You know, what's the through line like that? Whether yeah. you're that creative director or becoming a creative director or becoming a successful independent uh, practitioner, why did you succeed where others failed? Hmm. Well, you know, first uh, to kind of correct it, I, I was in the creative industry, but I was more on the marketing director side. So I was more like the producer um, strategist, but I worked in the creative team. So I was part of the creative team, but I wish I was the creative directors, but I'm not that good. <laughs> but it is still a creative role, right? And I think that that actually, to your point, um, many creatives have such a hard time they're so creative, but they have such a hard time putting things into like a linear process or like, here's your deadline. And so I always said like, my job was to herd the cats, right? It was my job to not only be part of the creative decisions and the brainstorming and, and the creativity, um, but also to make sure that shit actually got out the door. Right. Um, and so I think for me, uh, if I really go back and I think about where my codependency has actually helped me, <laughs> Right. And we talk about the through line. I, I do say I teach a bunch of codependency courses. And actually, one of the things I always say is that this, these codependent tendencies are not always the worst thing ever. You know, things like this can either be our superpower or our kryptonite. It just depends on how you use them and how much you understand them. Um, and so for me, pre-understanding them, I, I relied heavily on that. You know, I, I'm very able to go into a room, read energy, adjust myself accordingly. Um, you know, I, I'm very extroverted, which I will say in the therapy world is different. Um, I know within my cohort at my grad school, out of like 32 of us, there was only two of us that were extroverts. Everybody else was an introvert, which I have found in my experience to be kind of the norm with therapists. So that has helped me, obviously, go out and kind of hustle and it, you know, it is what it is, but that is a part of it. Um, but I think as far as through line goes, I think for me, it was resiliency. I think, you know, being comfortable with, well, comfortable as much as we can be as humans, comfortable with change, um, working on my own, being very grounded in my own practices. So my own yoga practices, my own mindfulness practices, my meditation practices, which really helped me be kind to myself um, be able to restart my life again and not expect myself to be at a level 10 when I'm just coming in the door at a two. Um, and I do think from my experience working with other people who have done similar career transitions, that for me was the biggest component to being able to be successful again, which was coming back to kindness, coming back to compassion of myself. Um, you know, you've got this, you can do this. Don't expect yourself to be here when you're here. It's that self-talk. Um, that, that was a big component for me. Um, I do think that the other part of it really is just, you, you kind of said it earlier, I do have this ability to be very like left brain when necessary. And I can also be very creative when necessary. Um, and I'm also very open to asking help Mm -hmm. from those people who have the skills in the areas that I don't, mm -hmm. right? I don't feel ashamed for asking help. It's like what you said about teaching therapists how to get clients. It's like, if that was something I wasn't good at, I would be very open to saying, hey, I need help with this. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Beautiful. I'm just making some notes. As you yeah. That's really helpful. I appreciate that very open answer. And I just want to echo what you said about how it's important to learn to embrace certain parts of ourselves you know like i have clients that come to me and i'm sure you do too that will say like how do i get rid of my anxiety yes, yes. and i always tell them you know what a person without anxiety would be dead yeah because, you know we we actually anxiety's um healthy function is to stimulate preparatory behaviors mm -hmm. and we just need to understand it learn how to dialogue with it learn how to maybe give it some better tools to get what it wants um, and actually listen to it. Because when we try to you know, drown out a part of ourselves, 
that's when it has to just stomp and shout and make up a panic attack or something to yeah. get our attention. Um, so by, by learning to listen to it, that, that makes so much sense. And learning how to ask for help um, is another big one. I think sometimes high functioning people struggle with that. They feel like they're supposed to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, so on the other hand though, it's actually a high functioning skill to be able to learn and assess when you do need help and be able to ask for it. So for anyone you know listening, I just want to affirm that, that it's always a good idea. No shame. And in fact, it's a actually a badge of honor to have the awareness that you actually need to ask for some help. So right. thank, you for, thank you for mentioning that. Now, I want to ask you another question because honestly, it sounds like you and I have kind of a lot in common, I'm kind of guessing, which is, you know, just that you've shared a little bit about your, your younger years and, um, you know, mine were somewhat similar, um, just in the sense of, um, you know, going through some tumultuous times and some codependency and things like that. And we're so vulnerable when, when we need help. So speaking again of actually asking for help, um, especially when we're younger and don't know as much, mm -hmm. but for even many of my listeners might be in their thirties or forties or fifties, but mm -hmm. they're having their first experience of saying, I think I might want to talk to a coach, or I think I might want to talk to a therapist or a yoga teacher or a healer, or, you know, some other kind of person that's going to help with that department. And one of the things I've also noticed with high functioning people is that they do tend to respect authority. Mm -hmm. And so if they meet someone that has even just like a bunch of letters after their name, which like a bunch of, you know, therapists are keen for doing. And I often sometimes find that there's an inverse relationship between how many letters you have after your name and how much knowledge and training you actually have. Um, and so sometimes, you know, the, you know, practitioners, they just want to pile up a bunch of letters and behind their last name. And then these high functioning people who just say, well, you know, this person has been to all these programs. I don't know much about the field. And so I'm just going to, you know, follow what they're telling me. I actually feel like that's this time when high functioning people can actually become very vulnerable mm. because one of their, you know, as you, you know, as you said, there's two sides to every coin, but one of the sides to a high functioning person is usually that they will digest and follow directions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if the practitioner is, you know, sending them off course, as has happened to me even before, and I actually talk about this a little bit in my book published by Macmillan, mm -hmm. Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety. I share a story about a time when I was in, you know, my super, super early twenties and, um, you know, it was like decades ago. Um, and, you know, saw this therapist that was just off base, let's just say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thank God that I somehow just had the wherewithal to recognize that and not continue going to her. Right. And so I'm just curious if you can share, mm -hmm. even maybe from your personal experience, if you've ever had a time where there was a you know, we know it happens, unfortunately, all the time in the yoga world. And I love yoga. I was a yoga teacher before I was a psychologist. But we all know that there's a million awful stories about, you know, yoga gurus that end up having like sexual, you know, issues with their, you know, students mm -hmm. and everything. So can you sh like share, how do we kind of navigate that line between being open and vulnerable in that psyche spirit? Mm -hmm. I'm opening up, I'm receiving the help, I'm taking a leap leap of faith. And even if it doesn't feel natural, I'm going to do it anyway, because my goal is to break my patterns. How do people kind of marry that with, but I'm going to walk away if it's wrong. <laughs> right. if you share a story from your own life or just from your, you know, thoughts about it. I would, I would be super excited to hear. Yeah. You know, what first comes up for me when you're saying that is, um, so the school that I went to is Pacifica Graduate Institute. It's in Santa Barbara. And like I said, it's, only, it's actually only one of two Jungian programs, I believe, in the whole country, and or depth psychology programs. And one of the things about that school that was different and that stood out to me is that it was still mandatory for you to do your own therapy. And in the state of California, that has actually, starting in 2021, that's going away as one of the requirements to get licensed. And that actually, in my body, I can feel the, like, being a very upset about that. Um, my suggestion that I tell all clients, uh, whether I'm working with them or I'm giving them referrals or whatever, is one of the first questions I truly believe that you should and have every right to ask a clinician that you're about to embark on, to your point, a very vulnerable, um, very raw experience, is ask them about their own work. Because what I always say to people is, would you go to a dentist that had bad teeth? 
Probably not. I know far, far, far too many clinicians who have never done their own therapy. That upsets me. That actually kind of enrages me to be quite honest and use a really big emotional word there. I really do not believe, I believe you're actually doing a disservice to your clients if you have never actually had to have a mirror put up to yourself and done your own inner work. So I'm very passionate about that. That first and foremost is what I tell everybody. And don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed to ask those questions. You know, you're interviewing this person to potentially be your therapist. You have to be able to ask hard questions of this person too, right? So first and foremost, there's my answer on that. But the other part would be, I always say that finding a therapist or finding a practitioner is like dating. You know, we all have this kind of like gut feeling that comes up when we enter into a potential relationship with somebody new, if it's romantic or even friend. And part of it is listening to your gut. Part of it is listening to your intuition. Now, for a lot of us, unfortunately, that that dial has been turned way down. Um, We have much more of like, I need to listen to everybody else around me, right? Um, To your point, high functioning people do tend to follow direction really well. They tend to take in and then execute upon what they're told. Um, And in this instance, I would say your job going into potentially finding a new clinician is actually to try to go inward and listen to what your body is telling you, right? So is your gut clenching when you're sitting across from this person? And if it is, listen to that. What is that telling you? It might just be nerves and that's okay. But if it's trying to tell you that something doesn't feel quite right, then you need to listen to that, right? This isn't about thinking. This isn't our left brain I need to think my way through, is this the right person or not for me? This is actually an intuitive sense. This is a a very specific feeling sense. Um, And if you can really follow your gut on that, you're probably going to be more likely to find a connection with somebody who's really going to help you heal um, rather than, again, thinking your way into something that might not be the best fit for you. Yeah, that's super interesting. I I recently gave a talk. um, I'm a consultant to Baker McKinsey, which is the third largest law firm in the world. And I gave a talk to them and I was discussing um, uncertainty, Mm decision-making in times of uncertainty. And one of the things I found in my own research, just preparing for the presentation, and you may find this interesting, is that there are neuropeptides that cross the blood-brain barrier. And they're the same ones that are active um, in times of uncertainty, Mm -hmm. that they they become active in the brain and they become active in the body. So, you know, to your point, when we have that gut, you know, kind of stomach clenching feeling, that's actually, I, you know, it's actually almost like a part of our brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I tell people to do when they feel that feeling is to actually dialogue with that feeling and to ask it, you know, what is right. it that you want? You know, what is it that you need? You know, um, to not try to shout it down, but to ask, you know, and dialogue with it. And I know uh, like a lot of people have you know, it might sound like new age woo-woo stuff to them when I say this. And that's why, to me, it's really important that as a clinical psychologist, I want people again to know that these are freaking neuropeptides, right? Yeah, give them the science, right? Yeah. yeah like this, this isn't, you know, just like my, you know, new age like side here yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like this is actual science, you know, which, which I just find so interesting. And mm-hmm. I love your analogy about, you know, would, would you go see a dentist that, that had bad teeth? Um, I make a similar analogy, which is, you know, would you see a college counselor that never graduated from college, you know, right. like probably right. not, you know, that they don't have those skills to help you get through that. Um, so I, I know I, uh, I'm not going to keep you forever. I know it's just a half an hour. Or so um, I do have a, a couple more questions for you. Yes. But, but before I get to that, I do want to just give you a chance that if you either had questions for me or if there was, you know, something that's coming up in your life or your professional offerings or anything that you want to share and talk about or mention how people can find you, let's make sure that we have time for that part now. And then I'll just get to my questions after that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're doing is awesome as far as like, we all have our niche and we all have kind of the people that we know we resonate with the best or the most, they resonate the most with us. And so I just wanted to first and foremost say, you know, I think that's awesome that you have found this group of people who really needs the help and sometimes is almost more afraid to admit that they need the help. And so that's why I think it's awesome that you, you know, focus on this, this specific population of people. Um, 
Right now, I, you know, the pandemic has been crazy for all of us, right? And I'm a new mom, so I have a little one at home, uh, seven month old. So I'm, yeah, I know. I had her in like two weeks later, we went into quarantine, which was what a wild ride that's been. But try doing that and managing working, right, at the same time. But um, so I'm not seeing that many clients right now because I only have so many hours in the day. Uh, but I, you can find me on Instagram. I do have a lot of programs that I run. Uh, I have a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program that I specifically dedicate to helping overcome depression and anxiety symptoms. Um, so it is based in neuroscience uh, and there's a lot of research backing it. So if you're interested, you can find that on my Instagram. Um, I also do teach a bunch of codependency classes every week, like I mentioned. So for anybody who's curious about that, please check that out. Again, you can find that through my Instagram and it's uh, Vanessa S. Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T. -T. That's where you can find me. Okay, cool. Vanessa S. Bennett. I may check that out myself <laughs> to, um, you know, learn about it. You know, one of the things that I always find so interesting too, like in grad school, when we were researching, you know, exactly which uh, therapy treatment is the most effective. One of the things that I thought was really interesting is that specifically only for high functioning people, what is actually less important, I'm sorry, what, what's actually the most important part is actually what's called the therapeutic alliance, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is the connection that you basically have with the therapist in so right. many words. And so I found that so interesting that it's really about the charisma in a way or the, you know, just personal accountability or whatever it is that you find that you connect with, with the therapist for a high functioning person, that's actually going to be more important mm -hmm. than, you know, whether they're practicing you know, some particular modality of psychology right. versus the other one. And for lower functioning people, that wasn't true, which to me makes sense. Because if your mm. problem is that, you know, you're seeing little green men, then it doesn't matter how much you like the therapist, you just right. need a therapist to basically drill you about, you know, the fact that there are no little green men or help you learn how to take your medication or, you know, whatever it is. But for high functioning people, that it was actually really the quality of the connection. And, mm -hmm. you know, Vanessa, you're clearly an easy person to connect with. And I just, I just want to say that, you know, for anyone who's even maybe listening and not watching the video, um, I feel like I see a lot of life and energy on your face. And I just, I think that's so important when it mm -hmm. comes to a high functioning person, we want to see and feel that there's a live wire. And, and I, I, I see that with you. And I think that's so wonderful. And, Congratulations on having a little one. I actually have a little one myself. Um, best thing I ever did. Um, you know, it, it is it is so fantastic. Um, but I, I did want to ask you though, like kind of another thing that I actually say in my book that I encourage people to consider asking their therapist as they're interviewing them. Speaking of like the cons, you know, we were just talking about like of energy and just how mm -hmm. much energy a person has and how important that is when you're working with clients is I actually suggest to clients even that they might even want to ask the therapist how many clients a week that they see mm. and how many, how many clients has that therapist treated that has my issue and, and, mm. how, and how many do you see a week? So I'm just, I'm curious about that because I remember in my super early days when I was fresh out of grad school, I was like a kid in a candy store. I could see like literally probably 40 clients a week. At this point, I'm seeing 10 to 12. And it's like enough, you know, um, it's really good, but I, I couldn't imagine giving more. Um, I'm just curious for you if you feel like you're in a phase since you're new and you're just like, give me more or is since having a little one, I didn't have a little one when I was new. Mm -hmm. So tell me about you in that regard. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's one of those when you get out, you're super excited. I do think, unfortunately, uh, depending on what state you're in, New York and California are very similar when it comes to their licensing, um, at least on like the MFT side. By the time you get the 3,000 hours, most people that I know are so exhausted that they're almost ready to pull it back by then anyway, which is I think very unfortunate uh, in the way that the process is run, um, especially because so many people have to get their hours in places that are very high stress, you know, and very underpaid and things like that. So I think that there definitely can be some things that can be worked out in the licensing process. But um, for me right now, I mean, at one point I was seeing probably about 30 clients a week. I think what I have realized, again, going back to the fact that I do feel like I'm a little unusual and that I'm very extroverted, uh, 
for myself pretty early in, actually, I was still in grad school. I was still interning at the time. I realized that doing one-on-one practice uh, full-time was actually not what I wanted to do. Uh, and the reason why I realized that is because I'm such an extrovert. I realized sitting in a room with one person all day actually wasn't doing it for me. I really love seeing one or two people a day, but then I like being able to also put my energy into, um, you know, like I teach, like I said, so it's big groups, dialogues. Where um, do you teach? I, I'm just- uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's an online program. So um, yeah, my partner is actually also a therapist. Yeah, uh-huh. and so he has this amazing thing called the the lab. And so it's almost like um, like a yoga studio for your mental health, where there's multiple classes every day, multiple therapists and coaches and teaching is it different virtual? topics. Can you see it's all virtual? Handle? What's the handle in case people want to check it out? Yeah, you can go to the website. Actually, it's uh, his his handle or his name is actually the Angry Therapist. So it's T A T. The Angry Therapist, T-A-T-Lab, L-A-B dot com. Love it. Um, yeah. And so like every day of the week, there's multiple, cl- you know, schedule classes, whatever, and you can jump into any of them. And it's, it's, it's like a monthly now, membership. Now, I, I have to ask, okay, so yeah. the Angry Therapist, does this mean that like he kind of is like a drill sergeant, like everybody, like, you know, reflect or like, what <laughs> no. does that mean? Yeah. You know, for him it was, so he's been doing this for a long time. And when he first uh, started practicing, this was probably like 12, 13 years ago. Now he was going through a divorce at the time and he was in a really bad place. And he really decided that as a therapist, he wanted to open up and be transparent and get rid of this whole, like, as a therapist, I had to be very stoic and you can't know anything about me and I'm a blank slate and all these things. And so he basically put this, his first like blog post, he's an author as well, a published author. He put this, this book out there or this blog post that said, um, you know, I'm angry. I'm not doing well. I'm a therapist. Like, how can I help you? And he basically became known as the angry therapist because of that. He was in a bad place and it just stopped. And so now it's just, it's just his way of giving a nod to like, as therapists, we have emotions and go through things as well. Um, and so that's what he's known as now, the angry therapist. <laughs> that is so awesome. Yeah. In, in my book, one of the techniques I teach is something I call the to-do list with emotions, which yeah. is where like we look at our emotions around the things in our to-do list and we, you know, use them to think about how we can get self-care or how mm-hmm. we can get energy. Because I think you mentioned earlier that yes, you know, sometimes high functioning people can be so good at putting their feelings aside that we actually forget that in fact feelings actually have an evolutionary value even that they can actually yeah. fuel us and inform us um so that's that's awesome well vanessa time has flown by i know thank you for sharing with me everything that you did um yeah. i hope that we'll stay in touch and i hope you enjoy your little one yeah thank you you too and i really appreciate you having me on this was fun pleasure was mine take care yeah. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Wow, that was such a great conversation. I really just feel enlightened and uplifted by the chance to speak with Vanessa. I find in psychology that um, there's a lot of studies that have shown that the effectiveness of a therapist is oftentimes less about even whatever modality of therapy they're using and a lot about just that therapist themselves. And so I can see where Vanessa is really truly an inspiring person. And again, for me as a former yoga teacher, now a psychologist, it's really exciting to see her really embracing being a yoga teacher with such freshness and excitement. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Have a great rest of the day.